Hey, welcome back to another episode of Adventures in Angular. This week on our panel, we have Lucas Paganini. Hello. We also have Subrat Mishra. Hello. I'm Charles Maxwood from Top End Devs. And uh, this week, we're going to talk through our setup and workflow for working on Angular apps. Um, it, just to get us started, it seems like most of the people I talk to these days are using Visual Studio Code. And I was just curious if you guys are using something else or if that's kind of the way we're going to frame this as far as the IDE or text editor goes. I think Visual Studio has now become more than just an IDE. It has everything in it. You have a lot of uh, functionality, a lot of extension. But if I say myself, I have started from uh, Sublime. Mm. Uh, Sublime text, uh, the, I think old days that day I was uh, doing with Django uh, in Python. So at, at that time, Sublime was popular, then slowly moved to VS Code. I currently, okay. due to TypeScript support, which is default uh, in VS Code, and a lot of um, extension, I am using mostly VS Code. Yeah, me too. Like currently, um, just VS Code for everything. I did use Sublime Text for a while, and I still have that installed just because sometimes if I want to open a very, very large CSV or um, XML file, which sometimes some websites give me and I want to open them, like I just can't do that on VS Code because mm -hmm. it just crashes completely. Um, so for those reasons, I still have Sublime Text. But for my everyday development workflow is 100% VS Code. Gotcha. I think yeah, I, I use VS Code as well, but most of the time I'm not writing Angular. So mm -hmm. I don't know how much input I'm going to have on this. but Yeah, I think for, for backend, I use IntelliJ. What about okay. you, Charles, for backend? So for backend, I'm usually writing Ruby on Rails and I'm using VS Code. Mm -hmm. So I just installed the, does... the Ruby extension. It does the Ruby ser language service. And that's the it's best magic. thing about VS Code. Uh, you can you know, just add extension. You can use any language you want. <laughs> like it's it's uh, like you tell, it's it's magic. Yeah, my son, uh, he's taking some computer programming classes at high, in high school. And mm -hmm. um, anyway, he's supposed to be able to do it all at school, right? Because they don't want to count on the kids having to get tech support at home. Um, mm -hmm. But he has the benefit of having me around, and I'm not afraid to go figure it out. Um, they're doing C++ and okay. C Sharp. And we've installed those language extensions. It works great. Which is one of, yeah, it's one of the reasons I really like it is because um, you can usually find a syntax um, extension and a language service extension, and then VS Code just kind of uh, does the rest of the work for making it easy to figure stuff out. Yeah. I think uh, mostly if you ask a personal use, a lot of people maybe. 90% people, I'm just exaggerating like the number, uh, maybe they are using VS Code, but I s saw uh, in some company who have uh, IntelliJ license or uh, some license, mm -hmm. they, as they bought the license of suppose Pro members, if which supports Angular, which supports React, uh, which supports TypeScript, they, like, their developer are using I IntelliJ and mm -hmm. I what I thought is they are what IntelliJ is doing, all the extension, free extension, uh, what we what we have in VS Code, like suppose spell correction, auto auto end tag, a uh, lot of things. They are slowly implementing that to their uh, to their pip pipeline as well. Right. So that's the one thing. But I'm not saying that IntelliJ is copying that, but it uh, uh, seems like that. So. Yep. Yeah, it makes sense. Um, I, I also know some people use WebStorm, which is also written by JetBrains, similar mm -hmm. to IntelliJ. Um, yeah. I don't, right? 
Uh, one of my coworkers uses RubyMine, which is the Ruby IDE that's written by JetBrains. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's it's fancy, and it it you know, it does some stuff. I guess a little more seamlessly than VS Code does, but most of the time, I just I don't need it. And I reach for the mm-hmm. command line pretty frequently, and that's what I find these other systems typically will give you that maybe uh, VS Code doesn't give you as readily as far as like hey here's a button you can hit to do whatever you're going to do um mm-hmm. is that you know i just go to the command line and run an npm command as opposed to you know in their system there's a button that does it mm-hmm. so. yeah actually i recently uh, learned a lot of new a lot of very interesting features on vs code um, like one of them being something very close to what you're mentioning, which is defining custom tasks that can be run. And uh-huh. it's really interesting because VS Code can just put them in the command line. So for example, the, the command palette from VS Code. So you can just, you can give names to your tasks and your tasks can depend on others. So for example, that problem with, uh, parallelization on on tasks that could work on Windows and Linux and Mac. Like if you just use VS Code to document the scripts that you you want to run, and you call the task from the VS Code task uh, task manager, then it can deal with all that to you for free. Like it can deal with the uh, differences in the operating systems, which I thought were was really interesting. I don't know if I'm explaining myself very clearly here, uh, but it's basically there's a JSON where you can define all the scripts that you want other developers to be able to run uh, in your particular project. And then VS Code understands that JSON and it adds that as commands to the command palette on VS Code. Oh, interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, this uh, this uh, makes uh, sense if you if you are using doing as a developer in a team, a, a new developer comes in. We, you just need to send send him or her the JSON file, and they put it. Everything is set up. They just need to change exactly. something according to her what they like, mm-hmm. and that's all. Not it, much thing. Um, I was actually opening up one project here just to know exactly how can you define this file. So basically you need to have a dot VS code folder on the root of your repository. And then inside of that dot VS code folder, you create a file called tasks.json. And then uh, from there, you can just define an array of all the tasks that you want to have available in your project. And so each task can have a label, uh, detail, which would be like a description, um, the, an array of other tasks that this task depends on. And you can also say how it should execute the, the other tasks that it depends on. So for example, you could say that it depends, on, depends order is a parameter, and you can say that it's parallel. So it knows that it can run the dependent tasks in parallel and wait for them to be done until it starts this one. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this is some of the stuff that I really want to um I really want to start doing in more depth and in particular so one of the things I'm adding to top end devs is I'm going to start doing like 10 minute videos on here's how you do a thing. Eventually I'd like to do one on angular. So if somebody wants to start putting that series together, let me know. But um, I'm one of them that I'm planning on doing is visual studio code. And so this is the kind of tip that I would put in there. Hey, do you have these common things you want to do? Um, you know, this is how you set it up. Is there, and, and if I remember right, you can also bind those to key bindings. Can't you? Yep. Yeah, you can also do that. So uh, since they become commands on VS Code, you can just keybind them just like any other 
command right. in the VS Code command palette. Yeah. Mm, pretty cool. Yeah. And like there's a there's also a property that is called problem matcher. I haven't used that, so I can't really be sure if that's what it was intended to do. But I was looking at the description of this property, and it seems that it's like an array of regular expressions that you can give to the task on VS Code. And then every time that a problem happens on your terminal or on the extensions that you're using, and VS Code matches the error message from that problem with the regular expression that you gave, it can give the developers the suggestion to run that task. So if you do that properly, you can create like a really nice onboarding experience where if somebody forgets to like start the database and then it's going to generate the particular error message and then VS Code can understand that and show a pop-up like, hey, maybe you forgot to run the database. If you click here, then I can run this task for you. Mm -hmm. Oh, nice. So is it by default or we need some extension to add it? No, it's, it's just by default. You just need to create a folder .vs code and then inside of it, a file tasks.json. And then there's like a particular format to that JSON file. Um, but other than that is natively supported by VS code. That's really cool. So what kinds of things do you have in there? Well, um, from the project that I am using as an example, which is the only project that was using that so far because our developers uh, discovered this thing pretty recently, what we have here is running the front end, running the front end mm -hmm. alpha version, running the front end with server side rendering, running the back end, uh, and then there's like one that runs everything with server-side rendering and runs everything without server-side rendering. So it's just a task that depends on others. And when you run that, it calls the other tasks. So they're basically just using that for the serve scripts. So instead of, instead of just having an npm serve SSR, npm serve uh, regular, npm serve alpha, npm serve alpha SSR, then we can have that in the tasks JSON. Some of these tasks they also have as NPM scripts, but it's just that, honestly, NPM scripts, they get so convoluted. There are just so many things that we put on NPM scripts that sometimes I get lost on what are the most important ones. So I like that the most important tasks are defined in tasks.json. And also, right. maybe there are things that you want to run and you don't want to depend on NPM for whatever reason. You can just put mm -hmm. them on tasks.json. That makes sense. I, I would imagine you can also add it to the NPM, um, right, so that you have the NPM task and then just have that in your uh, tasks.json. Task, yeah. So then it's NPM run whatever. Um, I got a bit confused. Now, you mean like from the tasks.json running an, an NPM script? Is that it? Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Yeah, like actually there's even like native support for that on the tasks.json. So for example, when you define the task, there's a property called type and you can say that the type is NPM. And then if you say that, you don't need to write NPM run. You just say that the type is NPM, and then in the script property, you just say the part that would go after NPM run. So for example, you want a task that runs NPM run serve. You can give it the property type NPM script serve. Right. It's pretty cool, pretty cool. Yeah. I think so the VS guys... Code kind of 
dominated the space of IDEs for web development lately. Uh, I, yeah. Yeah. People don't even have any confusions about that. Uh, I had some colleagues that were using um, IDEs from JetBrains, but uh -huh. they just gave up because the community support on VS Code, the amount of extensions that you get there, like it's just something that you can't compete with. You can do something that is faster, but still, like we're we're talking about milliseconds, so people are mostly preferring the user experience and the features. So even right. though VS Code is technically slower than some ID, some other IDEs, um, it's faster in the sense of um, having more features. Like it's faster for the community to build things on it. So it ends up winning. Yeah, one downside I can say about VS Code, which was I, I faced in my old laptop, as I, I think I have less RAM and, and a, uh, the inferior I think, i5 processor. So in that, when I, when I was opening multiple VS Code uh, window, so it was taking a lot of RAM and a lot of CPU, which was not the case of maybe um, IntelliJ or Eclipse. Uh, so that that was, but I think nowadays, if you have a newer laptop and it it is it, not, not not at all slow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I haven't had any performance issues, but. Mm -hmm. And my MacBook's a few years old, so I, I don't know. I don't know what would cause that. So yeah, I think you know, by looking VS Code, we can say that how powerful JavaScript can be. Like using Electron, and you can you can develop with this quite big, complicated uh, software, and which runs uh, in machine uh, so, so efficiently. So uh, maybe people. Like if you discuss with a C++ or a Rust developer, they will say JavaScript is slow. But VS Code is a pretty good example of uh, how uh, efficiently you can write code so that it, it will run efficiently in your system. Definitely. Definitely. Yep. So besides um sort of the basic vs code setup as far as you know maybe installing an angular extension are there other tools or extensions that you're using and also setting up the, the test out jason i don't want to discount that because i think it's cool but yeah other other so things you're of, doing that help you one of the best extension which i thought which uh, removed a lot of my work is remote as ssh so it allows you to if you are running if you have a uh, system in your company where everyone have a, their own VPN kind of thing, instead of going and uh, coding in, in Beam or something, just do re remote SSS to your uh, server and it gets all the codes and you can run right, you can write there itself and you can uh, create a, a reverse proxy to your local host as well. So it has a proxy tab, it will come so when you run the code, it will run, have a proxy card so it, it now you can run your local but it will hit the server and it's pretty pretty fast as well so the same thing okay so, on our company. so uh so what thing happens is usually what we used to do is you code in local merge that file to your uh, development server then test it uh, or run it in the, on the uh, on the dev environment so what it will do if you uh, you can now directly code in your development server and just run it, run it directly. So that is less. Uh, there is one step reduced to sync your file to with your development server and do it. But I think it will not help everyone who don't have a dedicated development server for each and every uh, team member. But if you, if you have, just use this extension. It, it will be a lot of time saver. So, Brett, you touched on a, a point that I am super interested in. So <laughs> I really want to dissect that. Dude. <laughs> like, I've been playing with those VS Code extensions for remote development for a while. And mm -hmm. one thing that I wanted to do is 
Um, in the very first months of my company, we were hybrid. Um, after that, we went to 100% remote and we stayed at 100% remote. But in the beginning, we were hybrid. So I bought some CPUs mm -hmm. during that period. And they are just on the corner, <laughs> you know, like <laughs> lost and sad and waiting for somebody to come in and do something with them. And I had this idea for a while now, which was to connect them to a network, uh, maybe like a, a VPN, an internal uh, private network, where my developers could get into this network, connect to those machines, and use them as development environments. Yeah. And VS Code, I, I only had this idea because at the time I was exploring an extension on VS Code that is very similar to this one that you mentioned, but it is a bit different. So there were some extensions that were released that are related to what you were saying, which is remote development. There was one in particular, which is called Dev Containers. And the idea of that extension is for you to create a Docker container that defines all the dependencies of your project. So for example, Mm -hmm. You're working in an Angular code base. So maybe you're using Chrome and Firefox and Cypress to run your automated tests. Then you can have a Docker file for development that installs Chrome and Firefox and Cypress and all the other external dependencies that you need besides your node modules, of course. Um, and then when you open up VS Code, VS Code automatically identifies that you have this Docker file which was intended for a uh, development environment, and it's going to show you a pop-up saying, like, this repository has a Docker file for the development environment. Would you like to, to start a Docker container and run your project inside of that? And then VS Code runs this container. It does a lot of integrations with Git so that everything that you're doing on Git inside the container also works for your local machine. So it does a lot of crazy stuff. You can like do port forwarding. Uh, it's really cool. But basically, it's that. like It's a way for you to define your development environment, and it makes it easier for people to onboard in the project. So imagine that you get into a repository. And then instead of you having to install a bunch of things in your machine, you just instantiate a Docker container with all the dependencies and boom, you're good to go. So what I wanted to do is do that, but do that remotely because it's kind of easy to do that locally, but it's very easy to there's do that locally. Also, yeah. 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 But it's very tricky as soon as you want to do that remotely, which is what GitHub Code Spaces offers, right? So I basically want GitHub Code Spaces, but in a private network using those extensions. So um, do you have more information about how this infrastructure can actually be set up, like from scratch? Because from a consumer standpoint, it's kind of easy once it's set up, but I don't know if you were part of the process of implementing that infrastructure there, or if you can give me some tips as to, or, and to the audience as to how they could implement that. Yes, first thing, first thing I, I would like to say the, the extension you told and I told, I think it's a, about the common package, which is remote de uh, development from Microsoft. If you in, install that, uh, your re remote Docker, like a Docker container, remote SSH, and everything comes with it. So that's the one one extension you can install, and everything will be handled. And about the uh, about the setup for the local, I think it can be implemented a uh, various way. So how we are doing in our company, it's it's pretty different. Uh, I think what what you are uh, trying to trying to do. And also, I, so I, it was it was pretty old as well. So, so I I was not part of that as well. But uh, one thing is, if you have a 
uh, any remote system which is hosted uh, suppose for your case you have a cpu and you, now you want to create a uh, different user for for x amount of developer and uh, assign them a server so they don't need to be depend on their uh, system performance so su suppose they have less memory or less cpu performance to build or run the development what they are doing then that will that 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 might be helpful if you just install a uh, remote server in your cpu and divide that uh, give that access to all the user you have created and they can directly connect uh, to that particular user and and navigate inside the remote ssh uh, extension to open something so uh, like am i am i clear or, or i made you more like complicated um <laughs> uh, it's you were clear uh it's still pretty confusing to me as to how i would do what the infrastructure that i wanted the infrastructure that i wanted to to do but yes i think it, it, it makes sense like everything that you said makes sense yeah, like I would suggest if you have a lot of you, lot of developer are doing, or if your developer doesn't have uh, much uh, CPU power or something, then you should do that because uh, this is a headache, like extra process to do. If if it is pretty pretty easy to do it in local, and you have few developer like ten or uh, maybe five or six developer, they can if they can coordinate between themselves pretty easy, and that each they are maintaining the site or the code base pretty well then uh, i don't think it is that ne necessity for now according to my point of view but mm. uh, if you if you have thought to use it you might have some uh, very good reason so like also i even thought about just connecting to computers even just locally i'm not even talking about like over the internet but over an intranet. So for example, connecting my notebook and my CPU, which is running Linux in a local network, and then somehow delegating a huge part of the load of the application to my CPU, but still developing and working in the source code from my back, from my MacBook. So I, I could do that if everything was inside Docker containers, and then, for example, I want to just instantiate the containers on my CPU, but I am actually working mm -hmm. in the source code in my MacBook. Um, so that would be one use case. And it seems like such a cool idea because I think a lot of people might have an old computer um, that they could think of using like that. But it's so hard to set up. Like you think that you're gonna buy time because it's gonna be faster to process something on a CPU instead of in your notebook. But the effort to make those two things talk to each other is just so hard that I think at the end of the day, you end up spending a lot more time trying to make this work, which is why I haven't actually made it work thus far because Every time that I tried, it was taking me so much energy that it lost the purpose. Like the purpose was for me to be faster, not try to make two machines with different operation operating mm -hmm. systems talk to each other. Yeah, it is cool to use though. Yeah. Like I, I never set up, but I, I remember in my uh, university, so we have a computer lab which has 16 or 18 uh, system in it and I was doing one simulation so I used and all all all, all the system are shared across each other so you can use all all the all of their CPU to do the simulation but if you have that kind of uh, organized system then then it is pretty fast uh, and you should use it but yeah it's pretty pretty hard to uh, set up alone you can hire someone to set up I think they have they have those set up they, they will do right for you Hmm. Okay, yeah. you, so Brett, you probably just made a lot of people go into my LinkedIn and offer this service. So I don't know <laughs> if I should be thankful or 
<laughs> You're responsible for every spend that I get for the next two weeks. <laughs> right. Yeah, I have to say, uh, I've used the Docker extensions. Um, I've kind of fiddled with the Kubernetes extensions. I haven't gone into depth on those. Um, I think I mentioned before that I'm doing putting together series. Uh, and yeah, one of them's the the Docker container deployment series, right? Where we talk about how to containerize different kinds of apps and what to do with them. Um, but yeah, the Docker can, the Docker extension for VS code is really, really easy. And if you have Docker desktop installed on your machine, then it, it does a lot of this for you. So, um, you do have to be responsible for whatever dependencies there are for your app. But yeah, if you want to run it locally, it, it's relatively easy to set up. And most of the work that I do front end or back end, um, I run in Docker containers and that includes, for example, running, um, so lately I've been running the front end stuff, um, either with, uh, Webpack or with, um, what's the other system that I'm using to compile stuff? I don't remember. Anyway, um, compile my front end stuff, but yeah, then it, you know, it sets up a small server, runs all my assets that have been compiled. It's really slick. And, uh, you know, you can either run it through the extension or a lot of times I'll just, I have a Docker compose file. And so I just run a Docker compose. And then when I change a file, it has a watcher that's running on there that just recompiles stuff. And so it's, it, hmm. it's really, really nice to be able to just run through that and have that Docker set up. And then the, the other nice thing is um, if somebody else wants to run it on their machine, all they have to do is install the Docker extension, Right. And, and then know the couple of commands it has to run. Um, one other thing that you were talking about doing remote stuff that you made me think of was the VS Code live sharing. Um, and it's a service that Microsoft yes. offers. Um, it's part of VS Code. Um, I think they have a paid version of it, but I've only used the free version and it's it is really slick. And if I'm running a dev machine on my machine and I want you to be able to connect with to it and, and run your commands against it, you totally can. You can set that up. And yeah, they have some security features built into it. So, you know, you compare with people that you don't necessarily know well, you know, know well enough to trust, I guess. Um, but it, it's all very, very slick. And so that's another way that I've gotten around to... Um, using VS code that I guess isn't strictly speaking angular, but is very handy. Yep. Yeah, I, think it will I be also handy like Git lens. For the Git stuff, Git lens. Yeah, Git, Git lens is good, yeah. Git lens, Git flow. Another thing that I would recommend as just a quality of life is Gitmoji. It's uh, an extension on VS Code, which gives you a list of emojis for you to prefix your commit message. It sounds stupid, I know, but it actually makes everybody more productive when you get used to them and just everybody a little bit happier. So for example, when you try to make a commit, uh, then, you're going to see an icon, which is like a smiling face. And if you click on it, you're going to see a list of a lot of possible emojis for you to use for your commit message. And then, for example, um, they have a description of when you would use that emoji. So improve performance, then you use like a lightning bolt. Uh, fix a bug, and then there's like an actual bug. Um, a critical hotfix, then there's an ambulance. Uh, deploy stuff is a rocket, so it's it's like a a nice a nice little thing that the developer is like. And when you go to look at all the commits in your repository, it just seems more friendly because there is a bunch of of uh, nice emojis. The thing that you don't want to see is poop emojis because that's what people use when they write bad code. So it's like when you need to do something real fast, it's just you use the poop emoji. 
And it, it's just uh, a funny little thing. So that's a, a quality of life extension that I would recommend, Gitmoji. Nice. Um, I'm also curious, you know, kind of maybe going a little beyond VS Code. Um, I'm assuming you guys are using Angular CLI for some of your stuff. It, are there extensions that make some of that stuff easier? Yeah. So you can uh, like, put those in your tasks or whatever. So one thing which helps me is not about Angular CLI or something. Uh, I use uh, oh my GHS. Uh, so it, that helps like to remember all my commands. I just uh, what it do is it, it you you can configure a terminal however you want, and also it can also auto complete your command by your previous uh, previous iteration so suppose i write ng new and it will give the whole command ng new uh, and the command the, the type name and ng generate component so i use that uh, to remember say like commands or or just to type less uh, file file developing mm -hmm. um i use the angular cli but through a proxy so we generally use NX for our code bases, and NX exposes its own CLI, which mm -hmm. extends the Angular CLI. So everything that would work for the Angular CLI generally works with the NX command line. I haven't seen things that didn't work. Uh, some of them might need like a, a different format here or there, but overall, it's just the same. And so in my case, I have an extension which is for NX console. And it just gives a nice UI for everything that NX exposes. So the difference is that since NX is a tool for monorepos, then there might be parts of your repository that are not Angular applications. Maybe they are just pure NPM libraries or node modules, like they don't even have Angular at all. And you can still run your build watch and run your automated tasks and everything from the NX CLI. So you can just use one CLI to run the commands from all of your internal packages from your entire monorepo. Instead of like, if I am on an Angular package in my monorepo, then I use the Angular CLI. But if I'm in a different thing, then if I'm in my Nest uh, backend, then I I use another CLI. No, you can just use NX for pretty much everything. Is there an NX extension, or do you just set that up through your tools.json? Uh, no, there is a, an NX extension. It's called NX console, but you don't need to install the extension to use it just the CLI. So to use it as the CLI, like as soon as you integrate NX with an Angular application, it's going to create a file which decorates the Angular CLI and like, I don't know all the internals of how that file works. I just know that it kind of patches the Angular CLI in a way that it's always going to use the NX CLI. Uh, uh -huh. But so you don't need the extension to be able to have that. So with that, you can already run NX from your console. Um, if you're just running that through your node modules, then you would run npx nx. But if you just install nx globally, then you can just call nx, which is kind of the same than calling ng, but you just call nx instead of ng. And it gives you more power than just the Angular CLI. It's actually even faster. So that's a, a nice performance tip, by the way. So. I have ran into situations where I simply didn't need it, many packages in my repository. So I was like, why am I going to use NX? Like NX is a 
a tool for mono repos. I don't need a mono repo. I just need a single package. So why would I use that? But even if you only have one package, if it's an Angular application, you still have benefits from using NX because it's literally just faster to build than using ng build, which is weird because ng build should be faster, but NX does a lot of optimizations. And like there are people from NX that worked in the Angular team. And even the ones that don't work, they are constantly uh, working in the Angular source code. So maybe they are not official team members of the Angular team, but they know the source code. So they do a really great job at optimizing it and just running some commands from NX instead of ng, it's actually faster. So I would, I would recommend NX for everybody that is in an Angular application, which is probably everybody from this podcast. Yeah, I think NX, uh, you just, uh, so I'm not sure about that, but uh, uh, does NX also update uh, according to the Angulars, update the build cycle or process or how they structure the code? Yeah. I mean, suppose for the Angular 15. Well, not in terms of the actual version numbers. So for example, it's not that you would use NX15 to get Angular 15. Uh, so the version numbers are not always so perfectly lined up, but I do think that they changed that recently. So now I do think that it is aligned, but it's not perfectly aligned. Like they are not going to always release as soon as a new version of Angular releases because they are not part of the official Angular bundle. Like they're not directly supported by Google. They are supported by a third company, um, which has founders that are super connected with the people that work on the Angular source code. And even they work on the Angular source code sometimes, but they are still not in the Angular bundle. So it doesn't get the exact same release cycle, mm -hmm. but they try to make it pretty close because the main audience that uses NX are Angular developers, even though they also support a lot of other things. So if you go into the NX website, you're going to see that they have integrations with a lot of other tools, not just Angular, but still most of the developers that are using it are using it for Angular. So you can use it for React too. You can use it just for Node packages. Um, but yeah, it's mostly Angular developers. So they try to keep things connected. Yeah, I think if, if they are not updating also, so might be Angular, suppose Angular 16 comes in and uh, NX might not be updated in a month, but they will update it obviously after maybe two months and and you will get all the all the feature of Angular 16 just after two months of release. I'm just seeing exactly. the timeline just to... Yeah, so I think uh, one of the feature we are discussing in one of our po podcasts that's why it got to my question that in that we discussed that this feature will not be available in NX because uh, NX is not updated yet uh, to the newer version. But uh, we are just like, as in the podcast, we are de uh, discussing about some experimentation feature or some uh, pretty new uh, feature which we just re release or go will going to be released in Angular so that will not be a problem to use NX. So, it, it will be available in, in a month or some weeks. Cool. Well, we're starting to run out of time. Um, this was really great. And I, I picked up a lot of tips. Um, but yeah, I have a hard stop because I'm doing the book club right after this. So um, I'm going to go ahead and push us into the self promo and picks. 
Um, but if any of you listeners have more tips on the tooling you use in your workflows and things like that, uh, we didn't even get into like CI, CD or deployments or anything like that uh, too far. So I, I'd love to dive into more of that as well. But um, yeah, let, let's do the self promo and the picks. And I'm sorry to cut it off uh, a little bit abruptly, but uh, that's kind of where we're at. So Subrat, what are you working on that people should know about? Yeah, I am currently working on the uh, creating cre- creating my videos. So I think currently I finished up the standalone component uh, series. Uh, it's not finished. I just, just the uh, of recording four four video of that and that is already out. So please go ahead and check that one. As well as uh, I think I have told but haven't started yet. So I am planning to start a, a video podcast. Uh, to show people that uh, how develop development uh, era is or, or development uh, kingdom is so how people are uh, really thinking of development it's not just the always doing the trending things or always doing so i i saw in a lo- lot of uh, university students so they have those mindset like always do the trendy things always but that's not the actual actual scenario uh, what the industry runs on so just trying to do that they, this will be the one of the aspect of the podcast uh, so please feel free to reach out to me if you want to be part of uh, a podcast or or if you are, are a developer in in some company awesome lucas what are you working on people should know about my case is the same as every other week, so I'm still hammering on the web animation scores. I am publishing a lot of exercises on YouTube for free. So I already published two videos. They're extremely in-depth, like I'm not making many cuts from them. The first one was like almost 50 minutes long, so pretty in-depth. And like I'm, I just get one motion design and I code it from scratch using no libraries, just native HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. And I explain everything that I'm doing as I am doing it. So this is available for free on YouTube. You just got to go to my channel, Lucas Paganini on YouTube. But if you want a more structured step-by-step approach where I actually teach you the concepts behind web animations, and then you can learn not just how I did a particular animation, but you can learn the technologies and then you can do whatever animation you want, then you might want to consider my web animations course, which is currently uh, currently has an open waiting list. So you can just go to lucaspaganini.com slash web animations and join the waiting list to guarantee a huge discount when the course officially launches. Awesome. All right, uh, I'm going to throw out a few things that I'm working on. Um, the big things that I'm working on specifically this week is um, I, I am working on getting more episodes up for Catapult Your Coding Career, uh, which is a podcast about getting ahead in your job, learning what you need to learn, not being stuck, um, You know, all of the things that I've been coaching people on as far as how to be successful uh, in your programming career and in your life. Um, I also have set up for top end devs members, um, the, the meetups for February. I'm also just going to point out that, uh, I changed the times, uh, mostly because I've been talking to people in Europe. It seems like a lot of the folks I'm talking to are in Europe and European time zones. And so I've changed the recording times or the uh, the times for the workshops. So the regular workshops are going to be at 9 a.m. Mountain Time. Um, and that's, uh, we're GMT minus seven right now uh, while we're Mountain Standard Time. So what that means is if you're at GMT, uh, that puts you at, what, uh, five or six in the evening. So it, it makes it doable. If you're in the U.S., it means that you might have to take a break from work for an hour to participate. But these are all going to be things that are going to help you in your job and help you also uh, be a better employee. So I'm just going to go through the list real quick. Um, We have the book club. We're reading Docker Deep Dive right now. 
Um, the first book club call is actually right after we record this, so you missed it. Sorry. Um, but the the chapters are actually pretty approachable, so you should be able to catch up pretty quickly. Um, next week, we're going to talk about how to negotiate a raise. That's on February 7th. Um, and by the way, these are recorded, so you, you can get access to them after the fact if you sign up uh, for a membership. We're, then we're talking about installing Docker in the big picture out of Docker Deep Dive on the 8th. And then the Career Freedom Mastermind, where you just come and ask questions about your career. So if you're stuck, if you're struggling with something, if you're trying to figure out what to do next in your career, uh, we're going to do that. Uh, February 14th is how to grow from junior developer to senior developer. Um, book clubs every week. Uh, we're also going to do Visual Studio tips and tricks on February 16th. Uh, how to build a software course on February 21st. How to go freelance on February 23rd. How to set up your YouTube channel on February 28th. And then we're going to, you know, that, that gets us all the way through February. So if you want to join, go ahead. Um, and I'm looking forward to that. And then, yeah, the other thing is, is I'm working on those series, right? So we're going to have the career series tied to catapult your coding career. We're going to have the VS code series. Um, I'm working on the JavaScript series, the, the Docker series. And there was one other one that I was working on and I can't remember what it was, but, um, oh yeah, it was the, the GitHub, like GitHub code spaces and stuff getting into how all that works so that you can use the tools that are provided for free or whatever uh, on GitHub. So anyway, um, looking forward to diving into that. Um, also the VS Code series. So my plan is, is just to record a bunch of those videos, you know, a month's worth of videos every week for, for one of those courses. And that way I can stay up on them since there are four of them. Uh, so Anyway, they'll, they'll be launching throughout the month. So if you're looking for, for more than that, let me know if you want to help us run some of the, the meetups and workshops and things like that. Also, let me know. Um, I'm willing to uh, trade uh, help for coaching. So um, anyway, that, that's pretty much what I'm working on. Um, Lucas, what are your picks? My pick is going to be a bag. So it's called a tech bag, and it's from Peak Design. Um, I am putting that on the camera for those of you that are on YouTube, but unfortunately for Chuck and Subred, I had a problem with my webcam, so they're not seeing it. But if you just Google it's Peak beautiful. Design tech bag, it is beautiful, and it is so functional. Like, I can fit all my tech stuff in there, and I'm not going to say that there's still space left because there's not. <laughs> it's completely packed. <laughs> but I can just put that in my backpack. And it's just so easy to move things around. So I have all my cables, the charger for my computer, my wireless mouse, my external trackpad. The only thing that I couldn't fit is my keyboard. <laughs> but I think that's fair. Um, other than that, every tech thing that I have, like the charger for my phone, my hub, my USB-C hub, everything just goes inside this bag. And it's so easy to move things around. So peak design, tech bag. Nice. Subra, what are your picks? My pick will be the like this pen tablet. So if you don't have uh, have a iPad or, or a pa uh, tablet with uh, with a styler, so this is pretty helpful to explain something or to draw something in your, in your machine. Uh, it makes sense that how bigger you can buy this. So I think this is eight inch or something. If you can buy a bigger one, it will be good to uh, so the scaling will be lesser. So for me, like the twenty four inch turns down to eight inch. So but it's quite helpful to explain something instead of drawing with the mouse, which is always, always weird. Like a, yeah. with the styler, you can, you can draw it pretty, pretty easily. So I think I am using a Wacom pen tablet, but any, any pen tablet can be uh, good for the scenarios. Cool. I like it. I might have to look into that. All right. Uh, I'm going to throw in a bunch of picks here. So, the first pick that I have is a board game. It's called Sushi Go Party. 
and Sushi Go Party is, uh, I think it's up to eight players. Um, we usually play it for four players. Um, and basically what you do is it tells you how to put the decks together depending on how many players you have, but you have different kinds of entrees. Um, so you have like the, the nigiri, you have uh, miso soup and different things. And each type of food is scored differently, right? And so what you're trying to do is you're trying to get the highest score possible over three rounds uh, to win. Um, and so what you do is you put the deck together like it says. You deal out the cards. Um, and then each turn you take a card out of your hand. You put it face down in front of you and pass the deck to the left. And then um, everybody flips their cards over at the same time. And then you do it again until the hand, you know, all the cards are, are placed face up. And then you score your hand. So some of the cards are, this card's worth two points. This card's worth one point. This card's worth three points. Um, those are kind of the basic nigiri cards. Uh, but you might have different um, sushi rolls that score three of these are 10 points or two of these are seven points or whoever has the most of these gets so many points or, um, you know, anyway, they all score a little bit differently. Uh, you can, um, I can't remember the spoon, I think lets you, it's basically a placeholder and you can put two cards down and put the spoon back in your hand. Right. And so as you kind of get uh, further and further along, you know, you're going to build up this hand. The desserts are all scored at the end. And so if you keep a dessert, you just set it aside. It doesn't get scored on that round. But at the end of the game, you get points for having more than anybody else um, or for having more varieties than anyone else or, you know, things like that. And so anyway, it's a pretty fun game. It goes pretty fast. It's probably a 20, 30 minute game. Um, it's simple enough to where uh, younger kids can play it now. Um, you know, keeping track of things over the longer term might be a little bit tricky for younger kids, but I think any of my kids could play it. My youngest is seven. So, um, yeah, that, I mean, that's effectively how that all kind of works out, how that comes together. So, uh, yeah, I like it. Uh, like I said, it's weighted at 1.3. So I'm really, really digging it. Um, a few other things that I'm just going to shout out about. So one of them is, is I've mentioned, I think before, that I'm training for triathlons. Um, and one of the things that I found is having a Facebook group that is active and can answer my questions has been super helpful. So super helpful. And so I'm going to pick, uh, I joined TriDot, and I think I mentioned that before, um, but their Facebook community for their, um, for people who are using their system has been awesome. And so like I asked questions, Hey, I'm having this problem with my training and you know, people jumped in and, and helped me figure it out. Right. Um, so I'm, I'm going to pick that if you're looking for a community to help you get ahead in, in some area, um, some of the Facebook groups out there are really great. So, uh, I'm going to pick the TriDot uh, Facebook community. Um, and then a few other things. And this is just something that I picked up on uh, Amazon. I picked up some tri some more equipment because, of course, you know, that's what I have to spend my money on these days. Um, and so I'm just going to pick some of that stuff because um, I kind of needed it. So one is, is I got a bike computer. Um, and basically, it keeps track of your pace and your speed. Um, now, I've been doing indoor training on my, on my trainer because it's below freezing outside and so this will this will help me know how far i went right so then i can start uh keeping track of um how much work i did instead of just going for an hour and knowing that i rode my bike for an hour um and it it will connect to my uh my other workout equipment and, and actually just automatically upload uh the one i got was the psych plus bike computer um i didn't want anything too expensive this one was 70 dollars um and so I'm excited about that. I'm excited to give it a try. Uh, the other one that I picked up was I picked up some bone conduction headphones. I actually have a pair, but I wanted something that was uh, waterproof so that I could swim with them, so I could listen to music and stuff. And so um, I got the Gogolin. Uh, anyway, I really like the bone conduction headphones. Uh, the other thing is, is that a lot of the um, races, the triathlons, they will not allow you to race with headphones on, but a lot of times they will allow you to race with uh, bone conduction headphones on because 
you can still hear what's going on around you because you don't have something over in your ear. And then the last pick I have, and this was another thing that the group told me about, my hands would get freezing cold when I'd go ride my bike if it was cold at all because of the wind. And so um, they recommended that I pick up some motorcycle uh, gloves. And, and the, those are flexible enough, kind of like running gloves for you to use. But yeah, at the same time, um, they'll keep your hands warm. So anyway, those are my picks. I am over time, so I'm going to wrap this up. Uh, thanks for coming, guys, and thanks for sharing. And until next time, folks, Max out. <laughs>